When I went to North Korea about a year ago, I had not planned to write a book about it. Three friends from London were going to run the marathon in Pyongyang and they asked me to come along and I said, all right, I'll, uh, I'll come along, but I'm not going to run the marathon. I was the guy who at, in PE lessons in school used to sit on the bench. Um, also, I didn't want to end up in a North Korean hospital uh, with a sports injury. So off we went and they ran the marathon and then there was nine days, uh, a guided tour of nine days on top of that. Uh, 15 marathon runners and two guides. Uh, well, not really guides, but minders, because of course they keep an eye on you at all times and you're not supposed to wander away from the group. Uh, there are two guides, two minders, because one keeps an eye on the other one. So they showed us everything they wanted us to show and they put up a good show, especially in Pyongyang, uh, which is their window on the world where they try to show all that's the best about North Korea. And at first glance, it looks perfectly fine. You have broad avenues with trees and everything is clean and orderly and the apartment blocks look quite all right. But of course, they only show you what they want you to show. And of course, they cannot hide everything. So all the time you see things um, which, uh, about which you don't know what they actually are, what they mean. So my book is based on the one hand on a travelogue, uh, on the diary. So if you read the book, it's as if you travel around in North Korea, but it's also based on the research I did afterwards. And just to give you two small examples, uh, on the second day, we drove in uh, the bus from Pyongyang due south uh, to Kaesong, a big industrial city near the border with South Korea, and uh, along the motorway, five lanes in each direction. The motorway had never been repaired, so it was one big pothole, and you had to drive very, very slowly. It had only been built 20 years ago. Um, but there was no other traffic on that motorway. Five lanes in each, dire each direction, no other traffic. Why? Well, it then transpired that in North Korea, to travel from a city or a town to another one, you need a permit from the government. So if you want to go and visit your mother, you need a permit from the government. And it takes three days to obtain it. So very few people travel around. But this motorway was an extra special one because it doubles up as a military um, facility. You can imagine five lanes straight as an arrow. Perfect if you just had some um, jets to land, military jets, or if you want to send 5,000 tanks due south towards South Korea. And along the, that motorway, there were these massive concrete columns a bit like these columns, but, but massive, which through explosions, explosives they can blow up in case of an invasion. Um, and so for this motorway, you needed a second permit, so nobody was on it. And then on that same motorway, while driving on it, you know, bumping along, on the side, in the grass, there were all these people crouching and doing something in the soil. Hundreds of them. They were digging for roots roots to eat. In North Korea, still today, about 10% of the population is malnourished, which is not enough uh, to cons constitute an official famine by United Nations standards. In the 1990s, there was a real famine, uh, entirely government-induced, uh, the result of failing government policies. There was a real famine. Um, Outside sources think that about 10% of the population died from hunger. Uh, it's about 2 million people. We don't know the exact numbers because they stopped carrying out the census as soon as the famine started. So when I went to North Korea, it wasn't just um, as a joke for the fun, because we all know the idiosyncrasies of that country. You have all seen photos of their funny generals with medals, you know, medal encrusted from, from their neck to their shoes, or the strange hairstyle of King Jong-un, the great leader. Um, in fact, the government prescribes hairstyles. There are 10 allowed hairstyles for men, and there are, I believe, 16 for women. 
So I didn't go just for that. I also went because I'm interested in philosophy and politics, and I wanted to see a country where Marxist, Marxism has been applied, where there is no individual liberty left, um, where all freedom has been taken away and the state decides everything. And I thought this was, I was really interested and curious about it because there's so few countries like that left in the world, uh, especially at a time when, when in this country, Marxism is again uh, relatively uh, popular uh, amongst some people, especially those who don't remember the Iron Curtain um, and the Eastern Bloc. And so it's, it's, it's quite good to talk about North Korea because there it is still applied. In North Korea, there is no individual liberty whatsoever. The state decides what you study, the state decides if you study, the state decides where you work, which company, which part of the country. The state decides where you live, in which part of the country. You do not cho choose where you live. The state decides in what sort of house or flat you live. But it's not only that. It's not only your official life, day daytime life. The state also regulates your private time. So three times a week, you have to go for two hours to an indo indoctrination lesson, political lessons, where you are taught who your class enemies are, where you are taught about the evil United States and South Korea, who are all on the brink of invading the country. Three times a week, two hours. In addition, there is compulsory membership of social organizations, so, such as the women's union or a trade union or the farmers union. Compulsory, with compulsory attendance. So where the collective can keep an eye on what you do. But even when you're at home, you, are, you have no privacy, there is no um, liberty. Um, because every 10 or so residents are combined, re residential households, are combined in a, an Inmin ban. An Inmin ban is a sort of residence association. And it's headed by an Inmin ban jun, which is usually an, a nosy elderly lady, quite bossy, who tries to tell you what to do. And she will keep an eye on your every move and she will be in direct contract, contact with the Secret Service. So she writes down who visits you, who talks to you. She writes down who stays the night in your house. She has a key to your house. She's allowed to come in when she wishes. Um, in every living room, it's compulsory to have two portraits of the leaders, one of Kim Il-sung, the first leader, and one of Kim, uh, Kim Jong-il, the second leader. Um, on your living room wall, on an otherwise blank wall, you cannot hang anything else on there. The portraits need to be hung at an incline so everybody in the room can see it. And it needs to be uh, kept clean. And the government, uh, I'm not making this up, the government provides you with a dust cloth to keep the, the portraits clean. And the Inmin Banjun will come into your flat to see whether you have kept the portraits free. So even in your own house, you, you, you're not free. Um, Put on, on top of that, of course, um, you cannot receive foreign television, you cannot receive foreign radio, there is no Wi-Fi. Uh, the only books that are printed tend to be um, the writings of the leaders and political uh, diatribes. Uh, very few other books are printed. Foreign books are illegal. Um, so you can't just ima imagine this sh sheer oppression. In fact, people almost never need to take, take a decision for themselves except perhaps uh, to try to find food. Um, so that's the, the situation North Korea is in, the complete obliteration of liberty, maybe to the greatest extent ever. Um, and uh, I will say a few th words more later about the concentration camps, but you could say that the whole country is more or less um, a prison. Now, some people, some of my um, um, socialist and Marxist friends have, have told me, um, yes, but this is not really a Marxist country. I mean, they're obviously a bit embarrassed that, that North Korea is in that camp. So they say, oh, it's not a Marxist country. Or even if it is a Marxist country, the totalitarian nature and the tyrannical nature means that it's actually a fascist country. It's, it's not really Marxist. Um, I would say to the, the first um, um, observation, is it a Marxist country? Well, all private property was abolished by the Soviets at the end of the 40s. If you have, for example, a little market stall or you try to sell something privately, that is punishable by death. 
and this is actually applied usually in public with compulsory attendance of the, the people who live in that area. The only way you can escape from that is by paying massive bribes to the authorities. Um, so is this a Marxist country? I would say uh, absolutely. I mean, there, there is no private property left. Now, the totalitarian nature is that um, um, normal and, and logically attached to being Marxist. But if you think about it, if the state does everything, then everything that goes wrong can be blamed on the state. So an awful lot can go wrong. So a Marxist regime is always unstable because there is a permanent risk of rebellion for, or, or, for all sorts of reasons. So the only re way such a regime can stay in power for a long time is through oppression, through, through tyranny. Um, and so in a way, North Korea just, is just a logical follow-up of, of Stalinism in the Soviet Union or Maoism um, in, in China before. Um, now, so how does the regime impose that terror? How do they frighten the population so much that the regime stays into power and the population doesn't rebel? Well, you may all remember the story of Otto Warmbier. Otto Warmbier was the 22-year-old American who died last year when he was sent back to the United States from a prison camp in North Korea. Now, Otto Wambier had been arrested a year before, about four months before I arrived in North Korea. He had been arrested uh, for stealing a poster and been condemned to 15 years of hard labor. Um, when this happened, by the way, when he was arrested, my mother started to call me every day uh, to tell me, uh, please do not go, don't go, try to dissuade me from going. So he was arrested, condemned to 15 years for stealing a poster. For stealing a poster? Well, in North Korea, of course, nothing is ever as it seems. And so the poster was stolen from the fifth floor of the Jiangbao Hotel. Now, the Jiangbao Hotel is a tower block in the middle of Pyongyang uh, on an island like this, um, and it's for tourists. It's uh, 44 floors, I believe 600 uh, tourists can stay there on an island, so they can't conveniently, so they can't go on a little walkabout through town at night without their minders following them. So it's, it's very convenient for the regime. Now, the fifth floor of that hotel does not officially exist. When you're in the lift, it has buttons, one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, and so on. The fifth floor doesn't exist. Why? Because the fifth floor is the spy floor. It's the floor from where the rest of the hotel is monitored. So there are cameras and microphones in all the rooms, and a friend of mine actually found a camera in his room. Now, among international adventurous young travelers who go to North Korea, it has become a bit of a dare to try to get onto the fifth floor and take a photo or bring a f souvenir. Um, so you can Google it, you can actually find out about this. So the way you do it is you go to the sixth floor and you use the fire escape and then you're on the spy floor. And there, it's from that floor that Otto Warmbier stole the poster. So when they then condemn him to 15 years rather than send him back, why do they do this? This is the reign through terror. This is to terrorize visitors. This is to send a big warning to everybody visiting North Korea, uh, do as we tell you or else. Terror, reign through terror. They do the same with their own population. Um, if somebody makes a joke about Kim Jong-un um, and is overheard and arrested, and not only that person will be sent to the concentration camp, but also all his family members, three removed, up to three removed. So, parents, grandparents, brothers, sisters, children, grandchildren, all carted off to the concentration camp. And you're not supposed to come out alive from a concentration camp. So nobody does it. The people are completely terrified. Um, the same they do, um, uh, they seem to do with their generals. So every other year, uh, a general is singled out for execution in public, compulsory attendance, sometimes by putting him in, in front of an anti-aircraft gun. Um, and this is to keep the generals onto the straight and narrow. The same they do with potential dissidents abroad. Um, they kill one every so often in a spectacular fashion, like Kim Jong-un had his brother killed at Kuala Lumpur airport by throwing a poisoned towel over his head. 
And this is to send a warning to all the dissidents worldwide. Um, don't try it, we can come and get you. It's after the Kuala Lumpur air, uh, incident that my mother started to call me uh, to say uh, that I really shouldn't go <laughs> again. Um, and to be very careful, especially for anybody looking North Korean in London. And that I should not put my name onto my book, I, I should write uh, it anonymously. So that's the situation, that is why the regime stays in power. Uh, do, they, do they have nobody um, who has allegiance to the regime? Well, in the 1957, Kim Il-sung introduced a new class system. They classified every individual into reliable class, unreliable class or waverers. Uh, reliable class, typical communist party members or people who had fought in the war against the United Nations, 1950-1953. Unreliable class, anybody ha who had owned some property at some point, like maybe some land or employed somebody, um, they were unreliable class. E everybody was classified, and that's hereditary. And advantages and disadvantages are handed out by the regime in accordance with your class allegiance. If you are reliable class, you will study, you'll probably live in a nice part of Pyongyang. Only reliable class is allowed to live in Pyongyang. Unreliable class, you will be carted, you will not study, you will be sent to work in a mine somewhere in the northeast where it's minus 30 in winter, um, and you will receive insufficient food under the um, rationing system. Food is still rationed in North Korea. Um, I think we should, uh, you know, we can go on and on about this. I think we should conclude here, and perhaps uh, you may have some questions. Um, it was quite an eye opener, and I would warn everybody, don't listen to your mothers and do go and visit North Korea. <laughs> it's absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much.